Pelos incrutis de limites nossos, de menos Deus nosso. Em nome de Pai, de Filho e de Espírito Santo. Amém. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, and my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Today is the uh, Feast of St. Mary Magdalene, sometimes described as the Apostle of Apostles. The Song of Songs, one of the books of uh, wisdom, literature, has a beautiful passage about a, a dream sequence of a bride seeking her beloved, her bridegroom, who has disappeared. She, she can't find him. And the passage perfectly describes, or let's say can be very well applied to St. Mary Magdalene. On my bed at night I sought him, whom my heart loves. I sought, but did not find him. So I will rise and I will go through the city, in the streets and in the squares, and I will seek him whom my heart loves. It seems to be applied to Mary Magdalene on the morning of the resurrection. This, this curious passage from the Song of Songs, a book that has a lot of paradoxes because it doesn't mention the law, it doesn't mention the covenant, it doesn't mention the promise, it doesn't mention salvation. Yet, it has been one of the most commented books of the Old Testament in history. Everybody seems to want to get a piece of it. It's the Canticum Canticorum. And the characters in this book, as we'll see in the, in the course we're having here on the annual course, they're, they're kind of blurry. They're like in a dream. And uh, there's no real plot. There's just... It's like, a, it's like a love poem, just a, a bride, a bridegroom. What is this? Is this a play? Is it uh, a series of ancient love songs? But what is clear, it is that it is written by somebody who is, whose heart is deeply, deeply in love. It's, it's as though the fire of love has ignited in this person's heart. And indeed, the, the vast majority of ancient sources and ancient traditions always interpret this spiritual, this, this song in a spiritual sense. That is, the lover is God, the lover is Jesus Christ, the beloved is either Israel, or the beloved is the church, or the beloved is the soul. But it's like a, like a love affair, a love between the soul and God, the soul and Jesus Christ. And today, in today's feast, it is applied to Mary Magdalene. And we can picture her now on her way to the tomb, now seeing that the Lord's body has disappeared. She is absolutely inconsolable. She feels like she's in a dream. She's in this reality what happened to his body she thinks and she she doesn't run away she simply stays there at the tomb a tomb really is a place of sleep and so it it leaves on her a mark of kind of like being in a dream she's outside weeping distraught many paintings have shown this this scene 
and the, her very tears have clouded her vision, clouded her judgment. She only knew that some mysterious thief had taken the body of the Lord, the dead body of the Lord. And two times, both by the angel and by our Lord, she's asked about her tears. She seems to be kind of stuck there, inconsolable. She seems to be crying for no reason. It's as though a fatalism has set in. She's overwrought by emotions. I picture, I picture her with her head down, maybe her head in her hands, breathing heavily, gasping for hair, distraught, going back and forth. Where is he? Is he here? Is he there? Has he been taken away? She's kind of, I suppose, in a kind of a panic mode. When I think of Mary Magdalene, I think of somebody who's had a rather difficult life. She, she likely had been quite mistreated in that culture. Probably she had a poor image of herself, as they say, low self-esteem. And she really, really felt quite unworthy throughout her life, even as she, even as she became an apostle. This, this cloud hung over her. Though meeting Jesus totally changed that, changed her life, it changed how even she thought about herself. Because precisely she understood that she was loved, loved in a way that she never had experienced before. You, Jesus, you made her see that she had inherent dignity, regardless of her history that she had a deep vocation now. And this picked her up. She was transformed. She was given a kind of a, a resilience, in particular in the narrative of the passion. Why was she able to stick around while the others disappeared? Because she had a, she had a resilience that somehow came from this understanding that she was deeply loved. And that she... She wanted to be faithful to that love, that she wanted to be faithful to that divine vocation that she now understood in it, probably in a way deeper than the others. She's always pictured at the foot of the cross, kissing the feet of Jesus. In the scenes of the atonement, when, when, when the Lord is placed in the tomb, she's often the one that is seen as being the most distraught of all often dressed in red garments. It's as though her own personal history weighs down upon her. She's clouded by everything. As though she is infected by kind of bad vibes. But now, all those things are giving her strength. Uh, all those encounters with the Lord, all those moments in which, which she spoke with the Lord, that they're giving her strength, even at the foot of the cross. St. Luke tells us that uh, seven demons were cast out of her. And for that, no doubt, she must have been deeply thankful, grateful. Our Lord had freed her from the evil one. And she responded to that humbly, generously. Imagine seven demons keeping you in its, in, in its clutches. The same thing happened to that demoniac in the country of the Gerasenes. These demons described themselves as legion. But Jesus had expelled them, freed that guy who had been, who had been possessed by these demons. He too must have been immensely, immensely thankful. He wanted to go and, and, and announce the gospel right away. And Mary, too, had that deep conviction. And that's why Pope Francis has, has called her apostle, the apostle of the apostles. 
And when she sees Jesus coming, the risen Jesus now, she doesn't recognize him. She thinks he's an ordinary person, some guy hanging hang around the area, some, some gardener, or some guy wearing a straw hat and taking care of the plants, probably some strange rake in his hands. It's funny, the, the fathers of the church have highlighted that, that contrast between Eve, the woman in the, in the garden of paradise, and uh, Mary Magdalene, the woman present in the garden of the resurrection. Eve spread death where there was life. Mary Magdalene announced life from the sepulcher, which is a place of death. I don't know how they always figure out these contrasts. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. Gregory the Great says, uh, Indeed, because a woman offered death to a man in paradise, a woman announces life to men from the tomb. So, what do we get from this encounter, this rather tender encounter? Well, Mary Magdalene's perseverance really teaches us that anyone, anyone who sincerely keeps searching for the Lord Jesus will eventually find him. It's a conviction we have to have for ourselves and it's a conviction we have to have for our brothers. It's a conviction we have to have for others. Anyone who searches for Jesus will eventually find him. And that is what happens to a heart that is in love. Remember that, that statement that we heard from our father's mother, the, the grandmother, she said, Jose Maria, vas a sufrir mucho en la vida, pues pones todo el corazón en lo que haces. Jose Maria, you're going you're gonna to suffer a lot in life because you put your heart in everything that you do. You're going to suffer because you put your heart in things. I think this could be said also of Mary Magdalene. She put her heart in others completely she was not mediocre she was not sort of average that's partly why she suffered and you and I it must be said about us too that we are men who have big hearts that, that really put our heart in those things that we do what the grandmother said about our father pues pones todo el corazón lo que haces you put your heart in everything. You really do. We must be men with a heart that, that is in love. We haven't sought a comfortable life here or a life where everything fits in well, everything goes well and orderly, we go to bed on time, we get our seven hours sleep. Uh, at times we wake up a bit grumpy and tired. Perhaps we think that the main purpose of the annual course is to catch up on our sleep. No, we know. The main purpose is to rejuvenate our heart in some way. So that it can be said that we are men truly with a heart in love. Not just us. It's not about us and God. Us and Jesus. You know, we love you, Lord. But we are part of the, this supernatural family with this charism that now I just read that the Pope has reaffirmed in this motu proprio. I barely even had time to look at it. That we do this together with the help of our brothers. That's why during this annual course, yes, we have to rest. Yes, we have to sleep. But we have to, in particular, protect the moments of prayer, maybe revive or enliven the way you live the Holy Mass in this beautiful chapel here. All this, the beauty, the stained glass, the, the donkey, the, it all has to help us to really live the Holy Mass in a, a more intense way. I look at that donkey and I say, which way is he pointing? 
I look at the, his backside, and I think at first I thought his backside was towards us, but then you look again, <laughs> and no, his backside is towards the other way. That was close. I, I wasn't sure at first. It, uh, it plays a game with you as you look at it. Mm-hmm. And, but what is clear is that his ears are, are open, like he's listening. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's all the beauty, the beauty of that crucifix. Uh, they can help us right, so that we relive that, that, that mass. But it's because our heart is in it. We could think, for example, of the, if, our, if the grandmother said, you're going to suffer a lot because you put your heart in things. But what is the main reason why I suffer? What is the main reason in my life why I suffer? Is it uh, physical things? Is it something humiliating for me? Is it my tiredness? In what way can it be said of you that you suffer because you put your heart in things. In what way? You put your heart in the apostolate. You put your heart in fraternity. You put your heart in your ability to listen. Now, what way? Like we have to examine this, uh, you know, in the way I put my heart in things. And when Jesus reached out to Mary Magdalene, he reached out by pronouncing her name, Mary, he said. And that's when she suddenly realized it was him. He says, Mary. And then she understood that no one pronounced her name that way. No one. It had a tone, it had this inflection, it had an affection. It was said at the same time with, with the knowledge of this and, the, and this infinite tenderness that only he could, could pronounce that name. He knew her through and through. He knows you and me through and through. Do you know yourself? Do I know myself? Would you be able to recognize the tender voice of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus? Do you and I recognize the voice of the Lord Jesus in our examination of conscience? It could happen that we're a bit like Mary Magdalene. We're exhausted. It's a long day. We're tired. We're not maybe really making that examination. We've got, we're in front of our phones. Okay, yeah, good. But but do you hear the tender voice of the Lord Jesus who says to you, <coughs> that norm wasn't really done with love. You forgot this, no, you forgot the gospel. Take note. Your mortifications. It's the tender voice of Jesus. Remember how the Lord addressed Martha in Bethany. He said it twice. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There's need only of one thing. And Mary has chosen the better part. It will not be taken from her. We have to hear those, our own name, like, repeated twice. Like Martha, Martha. He repeats the name twice as as though once was to wake her up, Two was to slap her around. And, of course, both when he said it to Mary Magdalene, when he said it to Martha, this was not, it was a tenderness. It was not a tone of belittlement. It was not like waving a finger. Lord, we ask you to hear that tender voice in our prayer, in our examination of conscience. We ask you to, well, repeat it two times so that I wake up to what you really want. Maybe three times. And in this scene, the scene of Martha of Bethany, which we had a few weeks ago in the Gospel, Martha, I can just imagine her now, she's just at the end of a rope. 
She was moving towards exhaustion. Maybe, maybe she was on her way to a burnout. She was probably just on the edge of a burnout. Her body was just like aching for rest, but her head was aching for a rest. I, I read this recently that the, that the very word burnout is interesting because it, it literally means, uh, I, I'm told, I don't know if this is true, but that it literally means that what is happening at the cellular level is there's a kind of a burning going on in the very cells. When a person is so, you know, psychologically burnt out that they see this with people with depression, that they actually have the cells of their body are somehow inflamed. I don't know how that happens, but it's as though they're burned. And this constant inflammation and chemical imbalance that is occurring in our bodies doesn't only affect our bodies, it's, uh, it's affecting our emotions, uh, our thinking, and ultimately our spiritual lives. That's what happens to somebody who goes through burnout. In our friendships, uh, it, it happens, it could happen that our, our faith is just limited to the realm of ideas uh, about what we believe. Or maybe we end up just in the many activities that we're involved in, the management of this and that and this work, just the, the whole busy approach to life. We end up just looking at the screen even before going to bed. We're doing a few last text messages, last YouTube things. Uh, and it's as though the brain ends up being drained of God's grace. Last thing we do is see the screen before going to bed. The first thing we do is look at our screen the next morning. It's as though nighttime, we have the, the, what we call it the time of night, when we're supposed to be recollected. It's as though time of night is only something that happens to me at night when it is dark. But our soul keeps going, or our mind keeps going. Because we're staring at the screen, or because uh, just because your phone is in dark mode doesn't mean you're living the time of night. Or this quiet time when we're, we're supposed to go and, and enter into that contemplative mode with our Lord. When Mary Magdalene was, was seized, you could say, by the tone of voice of our Lord, the sound of that voice, when she heard it, at first she just thought it was a run-of-the-mill person, just a gardener, but now the tone of her, his voice made her stop in her tracks and she threw herself at him. It was the sound of the voice. I know that some of you listen to 10 Minutes with Jesus and you can recognize the voice of the priests because they don't put the names of the guys there and it's, a, it's amazing how unique a voice can be. There's an accent maybe, but just, just the voice, the tone, the, you know, the way they speak. For her too, this was the voice of Jesus. The voice of God. Sometimes when you, well, you read the gospel, you hear about a voice from heaven, like in the baptism of Jesus, or the voice that the apostles heard in the transfiguration or the voice that Paul heard on his way to Damascus. We might imagine that voice, maybe the, the, the voice that Paul heard, but that nobody else heard. We might imagine it as something rather anonymous, kind of thunderous, maybe a kind of a disembodied voice thundering from above. Or in the baptism, this is my beloved son. But it doesn't matter, what did that voice really sound like? Maybe you heard the story of, a, of this homeless guy in, I think it was in New York. He, he, he was begging for money 
and he used he would carry like a cardboard thing with a text about himself at at red lights hoping that somebody would give him money and he the title said something like uh, I am the man with the golden voice. He says, please give me some money so I can go and buy some food or something like that. And uh, a guy would pass by there often and he ended up, for whatever reason, just filming him with his phone. And the guy would say, I am the man with the golden voice. And, and speaking, you know, asking, if you can spare a dime for this homeless person, I am. My Ned, his name was Ted Williams. And so that video that was filmed somehow ended up in some movie producer who heard it and was just amazed at the, at the beauty of this guy's voice. And he was a homeless guy. He was lacking teeth. He was just, you know. And they tracked him down. They brought him into the NBC studios. And, uh, and he's the guy who announces Matt Lauer, you know, in this morning with Matt Lauer. He's got an amazing voice, you know. He does the trailers for movies now. and uh, In a world where... You know, and this completely transformed his, his, his life because of his voice. It was now, it's now a warm and familiar voice. And this is the voice that Mary Magdalene heard. It's the voice that we have to hear too in some way. It was not the voice of a stranger. It was the voice of God made man with this unimaginable warmth, this tenderness, which we ask you, Lord, help us to hear your voice. I mean, maybe I can somehow hear it in my prayer. Do I hear that, that voice of God? What steps must I take to be able to recognize it? Maybe my prayer is rather dry or maybe I feel stuck or I don't really recognize him. I don't really hear your voice, Lord. The phone is always screaming for attention. You hear the chime of notifications. We have to mute the media influx. Those are not the voices we really want to hear. During the annual course, we want to take a step back and be able to hear the voice of God. Somehow, it's like an internal voice that we can hear. Otherwise, our, our imagination can be like on the spin cycle of a, of, a, of a washing machine that drains us out. You know, when the, you put the clothes in, it's, put it in the washing machine, it, it cleans for a while like this, and it shakes and shakes, and then with time, it goes in the spin cycle. And, that's what our head can be sometimes. And on the spin cycle, it sucks us dry of, of all the grace of God and, and even of the voice of God. You take those clothing out of the washing machine that has gone through the spin cycle, I mean, it's, it's just barely recognizable as a shirt. I mean, it's just like scrunched up. And, and that's what an activist life can be. I don't want that, Lord. If you ever read the, the diaries of St. Faustina, you'll see how on such, she's on such intimate terms with Jesus. She says on one occasion, she says, on one occasion I hear these words in my soul. I hear words in my soul. She says, make a novena, this is what he says to her, make a novena for your country. This novena will consist in the recitation of the litany of the saints. Ask your confessor, for permission. She goes, okay, got it. I'll do that. And uh, this was in 1933. How beautiful it is to have that kind of dialogue with our Lord, the risen Lord. Let us ask, uh, let us ask St. Mary Magdalene, who heard the voice of Jesus and recognized that he was the risen one. She was among the first ones. Let's ask her to hear the tender voice of the Lord Jesus in our prayer so that we too can make a, a deep act, act of faith and let our heart become ablaze and be fall in love 
with the Lord Jesus in our life. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.